Epidermal tumors itself can be non-melanocytic or melanocytic. Again, they can be benign or malignant. So epidermal tumors, non-melanocytic and benign include squamous papilloma, which everyone knows. You can always know the red flag signs. Next is seboric keratosis. Seboric keratosis, uh, appearance of seboric keratosis in larger numbers may indicate a paraneoplastic syndrome. And the base of the uh, seboric keratosis may have inflammation. Uh, that is called as a lesser trilate sign. Next is inverted follicular keratosis, keratoacanthoma, and also cutaneous horn. Mm. Okay. Next is epidermal tumors which are pre-malignant. This include actinic keratosis which can occur in different forms and also seroderma pigmentosum. Next is epidermal tumors which could be malignant. Most common that is basal cell carcinoma and it is more common in non-Asians. More than 50% occurs in lower lid and important predisposing factor is uh, exposure to UV light. Various clinical forms can occur. One is nodular form. Next is nodulo ulcerative form. Next is infiltrating form. And finally, you have a pigmented variety also. So you always have to look for features of orbital invasion, that is fixation to orbital bone, limitation of ocular motility, and also globe displacement. These are more common in infiltrative types and those at medial canthal location. And risk of recurrence is always there in those with incomplete excision and also those with aggressive histologic types like infiltrative type. Next is squamous cell carcinoma. Again, it occurs, uh, the main predisposing factor is supposed to be exposure to UV light. It can also arise from pre-malignant lesions like actinic keratosis. Then immunosuppressed individuals also are predisposed to develop squamous cell carcinoma. Unlike basal cell, it can metastasize to pre-auricular uh, and submantibular lymph nodes. It clinically appears as an elevated, painless, indurated plaque or nodule. The poor prognostic factors of uh, squamous cell carcinoma include perineural spread, orbital invasion, a local tumor extension and also regional extension. These are the poor prognostic factors. Now epidermal tumors, balanocytic and benign include freckles, lentigo simplex, solar lentigo and also eyelid nevus. Eyelid nevus can be congenital or acquired. Congenital includes split nevus and nevus of aorta or blue nevus. Lentigo maligna. These features, malignant cells confined to the epidermis. It is a very flat or slightly elevated lesion with asymmetrical or irregular borders with notched outline and also with uneven pigmentation. Malignant melanoma, that is if there is any breach of the epidermal basement membrane by the atypical melanocytes, it is considered as malignant melanoma. If it is confined to epidermis, it is called as lentigo maligna. Next is adnexal lesions, which may include cystic or solid lesions. Cystic lesions include epidermal or inclusion cyst, most commonly called as epidermoid cyst. Then uh, hydrocystoma. This is hydrocystoma and next is trichelemal or pilacyst. Solid lesions include sweat gland tumors like syringoma, pleomorphic adenoma and also sweat gland carcinoma. Hair follicular tumors like trichoepithelioma, trichofolliculoma and also sebaceous gland tumors. Sebaceous gland adenoma and carcinoma. It can be a part of muir torre syndrome, which is a rare cancer predisposition syndrome in which sebaceous adenoma, adenocarcinoma, keratoencarthoma, and basal cell carcinoma can be associated with visceral malignancies like colorectal and genitourinary malignancy. So those with uh, sebaceous gland carcinoma, you have to always rule out visceral malignancies. So usually it occurs in elderly females. It has got a multifocal origin and it has got a peculiar spread called a superficial spread or pegetoid spread. And this differentiates sebaceous gland carcinoma from basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma. It's more common in upper leg, but it can also occur in lower lid. Then there is no characteristic clinical appearance. Pegetoid infiltration of the conjunctival epithelium and skin epidermis is the hallmark. The tumor can arise from a booming glands of the tarsus, in which situation it may mimic chalazion, like this, and it can also occur at the Z's gland at the eyelid margin or sebaceous glands in the caruncle or eyebrow. 
It is one of the dangerous eyelid tumors. It can masquerade as blepharoconjunctivitis, chalazion, or superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis, or as other ocular tumors like basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma. Pegetoid spread is classical of this sebaceous gland carcinoma. It occurs in 60 to 80 percentage of cases. In a study by Swati Kaligi et al. at LVPI, tumor morphology and size may predict the occurrence of pegetoid spread. Diffuse eyelid involvement and larger tumor diameter may predispose to this pegetoid spread. High degree of suspicion of pegetoid spread should be there and conjunctival congestion away from the primary tumor indicates distance depletions. So Putterman advised the 16 site conjunctival biopsy and initially we used to do this conjunctival biopsy only in suspected cases but it is said now it is better to do in all cases. Here we have three sites from the upper tarsal conjunctiva, three from the upper fornicial conjunctiva, three from the lower fornicial and three from the lower tarsal and also you have four sites from the bulbar conjunctiva. Now they also say that it is better to uh, take a biopsy from the medial caruncle also. So that counts to around 17 sites. Next is stromal tumors. There are umpteen number of stromal tumors. The more common ones are vascular tumors like capillary hemangioma, nevus flammus, cavernous hemangioma and also pyogenic granuloma. Capillary hemangioma as all know, it is congenital and it grows rapidly during the first 6 to 12 months and involutes gradually until 4 to 7 years. There are two varieties, superficial and deep varieties. Superficial appears like strawberry nevus and deeper one usually have a bluish hue. And the peculiarity is they bleach by application of direct pressure. Next is nevus flemus. Nevus flemus usually is unilateral. It involves eyelids and periocular area that is along the distribution of trigeminal. And it is always present at birth and becomes darker and more prominent over time. It never disappears on its own and it does not bleach on pressure. About 10% of cases is associated with sturge pepper. Next is cavernous hemangioma. It arises in the second to fourth decades of life and it does not regress on its own. Superficial lesions may have a bluish hue in color, a bluish hue, and, but deeper lesions usually shows no skin change. Next is pyogenic granuloma. It is one of the most common lituma which you see. It is also called as lobular capillary hemangioma. And it is an acquired vascular lesion and it occurs on the ocular or palpebral surface related to inflammation from chalazia, trauma or surgery. They can be unsightly and it can cause spontaneous bleed and also cause irritation. And there are different types of biopsy in tumors. They include excisional biopsy, especially if you suspect a malignant lesion. You always do an excisional biopsy with keeping a margin free of tumor. Then you have an incisional biopsy, punch biopsy, which is easier to perform. Snip biopsies in pedunculated lesions, curate biopsies, and also shave biopsies, which you always do in elevated lid lesions. Thank you. Next, I would like to invo uh, um, invite Dr. Marianne Polly. She is a senior consultant, Giridhar Eye Institute, Kochi. She did her fellowship in oculoplasty from Shankara Netralaya and also fellowship in ocular oncology from Wills Eye Institute, USA. She received the Jayaban Chamalal Gold Medal for Best Outgoing Subspeciality Fellow from Shankara Netralaya, Chennai. So this is a very few to mention. And I would also uh, like to uh, thank Madam because I personally used to call her an uh, umpteen number of times so, uh, to clear so many doubts. And she used to answer these without any hesitation. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, to the early morning session. Uh, I thank Dr. Sandhya uh, for giving me this opportunity. So in this 10 minutes, you know, uh, lit tumors is a wide spectrum of tumors, benign, malignant, then uh, metastasis, lots of things. So I thought I'll just cover briefly the few important points. So management. So uh, I basically I will classify into malignant tumors and benign tumors. So in malignant tumors, the basic principles are uh, wide excision with 4 millimeter margins, then margin clearance. So in my practice, I always do frozen section malignant tumors, then reconstruct and follow up the patient regularly for uh, recurrence, local recurrence as well as systemic metastasis. 
So the most common tumor which we see is sebaceous gland carcinoma. So diagnosis is quite evident from this. So this is a, a big tumor uh, almost involving the canvas and lower lip. So the reconstruction procedure is um, huge. So when, in a, when you reconstruct an eyelid, two things we have to remember. One, you have to give a posterior lamella as well as an anterior lamella. So in this case, I'll just show a small video. So what I do is, I do in the two settings. First, I will excise the tumor and send the patient back to room or ward, wait for the result of frozen section results. So afterwards, I will call the patient. So in this posterior lamella is uh, reconstructed with Hughes flap. The Hughes flap is uh, raised from the upper lip. So Hughes tarso conjunctival flap. So when you do Hughes flap, make sure the sutures are not irritating the uh, surface. So we have to form the canvas also. So form the canvas, uh, form the lateral canvas with uh, non-absorbable sutures. So for posterior lamella is by uh, periosteal flap as well as Hughes tarso conjunctival flap. Then for the anterior lamella, I have taken a trippier flap that is uh, myocutaneous flap from the upper eyelid. Since she has lots of loose skin, uh, I could take trippier flap. Uh, the flap is raised. and uh, it is uh, attached to the uh, skin. And now the rest of the part, you can advance it superiorly. You can advance superiorly and uh, close it. So this, uh, this is the uh, post-operative picture, immediate post-op, and after flap division is done after uh, three to four weeks. So now this is, an, the, so this tumor was involving the lower eyelid. Now we'll see a tumor involving the upper eyelid. Again, a large tumor. So in uh, tumors more than uh, five millimeters, we have already listened from Dr. Sandhya, better to do, always do um, mouth biopsy to rule out a multifocal spread or pagetor spread. So in this case, we have uh, reconstructed with cutler bird flap, and this is his post-operative picture. So now coming to the, uh, if it is involves the orbit, like what are the treatment options? So previously once any lid tumor involving the orbit, all will always go for eccentration. So now we are having um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy using carboplatin F5FU, 5-fluorouracil. So it is used in large tumors with orbital extension and those with regional lymph nodes. It will downstage the tumor and uh, it, will take, it will take care of the micrometastasis. So you can give three cycles downstage the tumor, then it might be amenable to excision, and then you can continue with the other three cycles of chemotherapy. So after uh, surgery, after surgery, you have to always look into histopathology. Look, so you have to tell the pathologist specifically. Most of the time they know. Uh, look for intraepithelial invasion, whether the margins are free or not. Even though the frozen section says margins are clear, sometimes permanent section can show uh, tumor in the uh, two and margins might not be free in the permanent section. Then any extension in the anterior orbit. So in large tumors, always get uh, imaging to look for orbital extension. The histopathological evidence of perineural lymphatic or vascular invasion. In that case, you have to give an adjuvant therapy. So lymph node involvement, uh, tumors more than 10 millimeter, and in pathology with the lymphovascular invasion. So whenever the patient comes for follow-up, always look for uh, preauricular lymph nodes, submandibular lymph nodes, etc. And any doubt, get a PET CT scan or even ultrasound neck sometimes scan if the patient can't afford PET. And every time you cannot ask them PET also, so get an ultrasound neck. So if any suspicion, get a central lymph node biopsy and if involved radical neck dissection, chemotherapy or radiation. Follow-up in sebaceous gland carcinoma is very, very important. There is a standard protocol for follow-up. So in the first year, every three months, second, third and fourth year, every six months and then follow-up yearly. Always look for, uh, as I have already told, local recurrence and lymph node metastasis. Pagetor spread, uh, Dr. Sandhya has already mentioned. Uh, this is a masquerader of chronic conjunctivitis. So uh, it is 17-site uh, mouth biopsy. Uh, so the, how will you take? So you can take a small specimens. First, you have to mark it. This, this is the paper. 
this is marked on the paper and on each site, one, two, three, four, you have to put the specimen. Uh, so what, if the pathologists know about more biopsy, it is easy, otherwise we always write specimen one, specimen two, three, four, like that. So that they can comment on each specimen. So it depends, the management depends upon the type, uh, type of amount of area involved. Less than eight quadrants, you can manage either the topical mitomycin C or cryotherapy. If it is more than eight areas, uh, the treatment recommended is excentration. Basal cell carcinoma also follows a similar protocol, but vegetal spread is not seen. Uh, the another medical treatment used in basal cell carcinoma is imikimode 5% cream. It is useful in superficial basal cell carcinomas, not in the nodular variants or nodular ulcerative variants. So coming to, uh, this is a patient referred to us after diagnosed does basal cell carcinoma. You can see the area of incisional biopsy uh, site. So she underwent 4 millimeter wide excision, but she was not willing for uh, uh, bridge flap. That is, she doesn't want her eye to be closed for annual 3 to 4 weeks. So we did with a free tarsal graft taken from the upper eyelid and myocutaneous flap lifted from the uh, face. And uh, this is a post-operative picture. Mustardy streak rotation flap is done when the tumor is extending to the face. So, targeted therapy has been uh, used in basal cell carcinoma as well as in squamous cell carcinomas. The only thing that is very costly and like many patients we cannot afford. So, vesmodigib is the drug used in basal cell carcinoma. It acts by alterations in the hedgehog signaling. Uh, useful in one-night patients and those with orbital extension of basal cell carcinoma. Similarly, in squamous cell carcinoma, EGF receptor inhibitors, that is epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors are also being used. So coming to the other tumors, so we, this is a, a sweat gland tumor, that is mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma. It, even it mimics like a cyst, uh, it is a malignant tumor, uh, at the looking at the clinical features. So in this case, we operated with a tensile flap. So in tensile flap, it gives you only anterior lamella. So what I have done is, for the posterior lamella, I have raised a periosteal flap. Uh, periosteal flap or the anterior lamella reconstructed with the tensile flap. So this is the post-operative picture. So what kind of any pages in this? Is this benign or malignant? So this is again a malignant tumor that is a pilomatrix carcinoma. It involving the again uh, adnexa, like hair follicles. Uh, so how will you reconstruct this after the surgery? So you can see the large defect. You can, it's a double advancement flap. So flap raised from both sides and uh, sutured together and attached to the periosteum also so that the flap will not sag down. And this is the post-operative picture. This we have already been published. So this is another case, uh, even though it mimics like uh, basal cell carcinoma. So you always, when you, whenever you see a tumor, our aim is whether it is primary or secondary. So always ask the history. This patient had treated carcinoma colon, so patient was not aware that this is related to this uh, carcinoma colon. Uh, management is the same, but you have to send the patient back to the oncologist. So coming to the benign tumors, uh, in benign tumors, uh, we can observe if you are 100% sure it is benign, always go for excision, and histopathology is very, very important, even if you are 100% sure it is benign, because malignancy can arise in benign tumors. Papilloma, we have already seen excision. So coming to the nevus, this is a very common tumor which we see in, you see in our clinical practice. So what are the indications for removal in a junctional nevus? One, the appearance. Two, uh, patient is worried about the risk of melanoma. Third, uh, patient cannot come for follow-up regularly, like at least yearly follow-up. Or the patient says any recent change in the lesion, either color, that is darkening or in the size or the uh, contour or surface of the lesion. Then melanoma-like appearance, sometimes we are also confused whether this is melanoma or not because of the irregular shape and the uh, differentiated color. So this is inverted follicular keratosis, a uh, symbol excision. This is one tumor which I want to highlight. This is not calaision. Look at the tarsal surface. There is no inflammation and you can see um, uh, thinning of the tarsus. This is uh, tarsal cyst. So INC will not help. It will always go for recurrence. Always excise the cyst fully or even you can do a small venture resection. So this is another tumor uh, which again I want to highlight. This is not sebaceous gland, not basal cell, not squamous cell. Is it villain? Is it malignant? So when you are in a confusion, 
since I'm I am very lucky to have frozen section, I don't have any problem. So excise, it was a case of uh, amyloidosis. So patient needs a systemic evaluation by the uh, internist. So this is a just a brief overview of the tumors of the management and thank you so much. It was really informative, madam. Next, we'll move on to the next session. Approach to ocular surface tumors by Dr. Anu Baskar. Dr. Anu is presently working as an assistant professor in Government Medical College, Koriko. Over to Dr. Anu. Good morning, all. Ocular surface squamous neoplasia. The term includes the precancerous and the cancerous epithelial lesions of the conjunctiva and the cornea, which includes mild to severe dysplasia, carcinoma in situ, and invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So the term ocular surface squamous neoplasia is coined by the Lee and Hayes, which include mainly three grades. We have benign dysplasia. In that, we have papilloma, pseudo Teleomatous hyperplasia, benign hereditary intraepithelial dyskeratosis. Then we have pre invasive OSSN, which include conjunctival and corneal carcinoma in situ. Then we have invasive ocular surface squamous neoplasia, in that we have squamous cell carcinoma and mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Then the incidence, it is commonly seen in older males. The statistics tell us that. The incidence is 0 0.13 to 1.9 in 10 lakh population. It is commonly seen in dark skin Caucasians and in areas closer to the equator. The average age is about 60 years. So now about the etiopathogenesis. The stem cell theory of the OSSN which says that there is abnormal maturation of the corneal and the conjunctival epithelium as a result of combination factors like ultraviolet radiations and human papilloma virus infection. The limbal stem cells are, they are very long living and they have a high proliferation rate because of which they are known to be the precursors of ocular surface squamous neoplasia. The role of UV rays, it suggests that it can cause a direct DNA damage and it can also damage the nucleotide excision repair mechanism. It also suggests that there is formation of pyramidin dimers and the P53 transformation, which is a tumor suppressor gene. The gene mutation also causes the predisposing, predisposition. And it also reactivates latent human papilloma viruses. So the human papilloma viruses has got a very important role. The viruses 6 and 11, they have shown a large number of papillomas and dysplastic and malignant lesions of the cornea and conjunctiva. The various studies have shown that the viruses 16 and 11 DNA and mRNA in conjunctival uh, neoplasia. So this suggests a causal relationship. So what is the role of HIV? The presentation is usually a younger age, more aggressive presentation, and this is the first presenting symptom of the disease. So these are the other risk factors like chemical exposure, cigarette smoking, vitamin A deficiency, and herpes simplex virus infection. So now we move on to the clinical features. It's mostly a unilateral tumor. It is commonly seen in middle age and older age groups. It is bilateral in immunocompromised patients and usually present with redness and ocular irritation. So vision is usually unaffected unless it encroaches the cornea or it causes the astigmatism. So as we all know, it is commonly arises in the interpalpable fissure area and along the nasal limbus where we, ha where we have more epithelial crypts, less melanin, and the UVB rays are more focused due to total internal reflection. And commonly it just arises as a fleshy or a nodular mass, sometimes sessile, and uh, it is a minimally elevated lesion. So whenever you see a patient with a limbal nodule, it is very important to see the morphology of the lesion. And even though the morphology type does not bear on the clinical treatment, it is very important to identify the lesion and confirming the diagnosis. 
So the morphological classification it is either nodular or the placoid variety. In that we have gelatinous, leukoplaky, papillary form, and velvety. Then we have a diffuse form. So the, this is a nodular variety. It is very rapidly growing, and there is high incidence of metastasis. Usually, it metastasizes to the regional lymph nodes. And gelatinous, which has got a jelly-like consistency of the tumor. Then we have leukoplaky type. Usually, this is pre-invasive and have a surface hyperkeratinization. Then papillary form. This has got a stipple red appearance, usually exophytic, and it resembles a strawberry appearance. So this is the diffuse type. Usually, this is misdiagnosed as a chronic conjunctivitis. So also look for the other features. So look for the intrinsic vascularity of the tumor. These are small loop of vessel which are present inside the mass. And also look for the keratinization. Even though this keratinization is not pathognomic, it is very common in squamous cell carcinoma. And they look for the feeder vessel. These are tiny torches, conjunctival vessel that dip into the lesion. Also look for the scler scleral extension. It can be uh, diagnosed with the help of a cotton tip applicator, just try to move the lesion and look for the ineffixity of the lesion. And if any margin of the lesion is not visible, it is better to do a CT scan to rule out any intraorbital involvement. So this next about the corneal lesion, this is very important to look for the corneal extent of the lesion. This is pre-invasive and it has got a motile appearance of palacin and ground glass. Usually, they have a sharply defined margin. On looking in ma uh, mag high magnification, you can see that fim fimbriated or pseudopodia-like extension. That is very important. You can see white dots over the gray epithelium. And these corneal lesions are usually avascular, indolent, very slow growing, and very prone to recurrence. You can also use uh, different uh, rose bengal straining and fluorescent straining to delineate this corneal involvement. Also, we have the retroillumination technique that is also better to delineate and to know the extent of corneal lesions. So next about the histopathological classification. So we have pre-invasive lesion which include mild, moderate and severe lesions. So mild CIM that is grade 1 which is the dysplasia which is confined to the lower third in moderate, the dysplasia which extend to the middle third, and in severe form, there is full thickness dysplasia, which is also known as carcinoma in situ, and in invasive oasis in the infiltrating cells which have penetrated the basal membrane. So next, about the differential diagnosis. These are the main differential diagnosis of the lesion. We have panis, acne disease, vitamin A deficiencies, benign intraepithelial dyskeratosis, pingicula, pterygium, pyogenic granuloma, keratoacanthoma, pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia, and malignant nevus. So these are the differential diagnosis, and it's very important to diagnose OSS and to, we have to differentiate from the other mimickers also. Thank you. Now I call Dr. Babita, Hasusit Professor, Government Medical College, Korikor. She'll be dealing with the management part. Good morning. Now we are dealing with the management of ocular surface squamous neoplasia. OSS can mimic many indolent ocular lesions like pterygium and it has a potential for causing both systemic and ocular morbidity and mortality. So we have to diagnose and treat it very early. By clinical examination, we can differentiate OSS from other ocular lesions and other diagnostic modalities include cytological examination, histopathological examination and new investigative modalities. Previously, vital dyes like rose bengal, toledine blue and methylene blue were used for diagnosis of OSSN and it has very good negative predictive value. 
Then cytological examination includes exfoliative cytology and impression cytology. Since these malignant cells has very poor cell cell adherence, they discommit very easily. So we can prepare slides for exfoliative cytology by using cytobrush. And impression cytology can be taken by using cellulose acetate paper or biopore membrane. And then cellulose acetate paper specimen has to be processed immediately. Whereas biopore membrane specimen we can wait for subsequent analysis. And it has 80 percent correlation with histopathological examination. The histopathological examination include excision biopsy and incision biopsy. Excision biopsy is done for small lesions and incision biopsy is for larger lesions. By histopathological examination we can grade different uh, grades of OSS and and your modalities include electron microscopy. The electron microscopy characteristic of OSSN are excessive mitochondria, turn off filaments and the plasma reticulum, decreased desmosomes, alteration in the basement membrane and deposition of fibrillogranular material between basement membrane and Bowman's layer. Then ultra high resolution anterior segment OCT, the characteristic of OSSN include epithelial thickening, epithelial thickening, increased reflect, hyperreflectivity of the epithelium and abrupt demarcation between the normal and abnormal epithelium. The limitations of ASOCT include optical shadowing obscure the depth of penetration in thick lesions and difficulty with evaluating invasion to the substantial propria. OCT angiogram allows the visualization of the vasculature of OSSN. Here it is the OSSN lesion. You can see increased vascularity on the lesion and in the so, uh, sub-epithelial area also there is increased vascularity. And also ASOCT helps to differentiate between OSSN and terrigium. In OSSN we can see zigzag like vessels in the both superficial and deeper layers. Whereas terrigium there will be straight vessels more in the superficial layers and deeper layers are relatively avascular. The in vivo confocal microscopy also helps to diagnose OSSN. The characteristic of conjunctival intraepithelial neoperation confocal microscopy include abnormal hyperreflective epithelium, which are enlarged, irregular, and pleomorphic. And anisocytosis and anisonucleosis will be there with high nucleocytoplasmic ratio. Carcinoma in situ and the OSSN is characterized by isolated, keratinized, binucleated, actively mitotic cells. In carcinoma in situ, it confined to a superficial layers, whereas in case of OSSN, it infiltrates the basement membrane. And the limitations of confocal microscopy are give only a transverse view without reference to neighboring structures and maximum examining depth is only 500 micrometers. Then ultrasound biomicroscopy, the OSS is characterized by hyperechoic sur surface with the hypoechoic interior. And here you can see the angle infiltration of OSS is characterized by blending of angle of anterior chamber. Then autofluorescence multispectral imaging depends on the tissue fluorescence which based on the chemical composition of each tissue. This is the AFMI image of OSSN. It has a green color whereas this terrigium and normal conjunctiva has violet color. Then immunohistochemistry markers are used for diagnosis of various diseases nowadays which positivity for P60 immunohistochemistry is associated with invasive OSS in HIV positive patients. And interleukin-6 is a marker for dysplastic conjunctival tissue. Then treatment include excision, chemotherapy, immunotherapy and new other options. Excision was the treatment of choice and now there is a transition towards immunotherapy and chemotherapy. The advantages of excision include immediate histopathological diagnosis is possible after excision biopsy and it debulks the lesion. But the disadvantage is high recurrence rate which depends on the tumor size, location and tumor positive surgical margin. This is the OSS and lesion. OSS lesion, first we have to mark 3 to 4 millimeters of normal area, normal conjunctiva from the lesion, then give subconjunctival injection, then we have to elevate the lesion up to its 0.5 millimeter anterior to its corneal extent with minimal manipulation to reduce the tumor seeding. This is a bare sclera after excision and then bare sclera is covered with amniotic membrane and this is the postoperative view. In case, in like this, if the excise state is more than 3 clock hours, we can use transpersonal conjunctive flap, free conjunctive flap or amniotic membrane like this. Or it is less than 3 clock hours, we can directly primary, primarily suture the conjunctiva. This is um, in coronal involvement, keratoepithelectomy with the application of 95% alcohol has to be done. In case of scleral induration, lamellar sclerectomy has to be done. This is the patient, his uh, preoperative anterior segment OCT showing the OSS and this is after four cycles of mitomycin. Here the entire lesion is relieved and conjunctive, conjunctive epithelium is normal. 
Then most technique of tumor margin surveillance is used for dermatological malignancies and its funds modification can be used for OSSN. And the nucleation and excentration are uh, for the orbital or uh, ocular and in orbital extension we have to do enucleation and excentration. Cryotherapy usually combined with surgery to reduce the recurrence rate. Here we use nitrosoxide cryoprobe of 2.5 to 5 millimeter diameter for a duration of 3 seconds. Then radiotherapy was used previously for management of OSSN in, ca in case of recalcitrant or unresectable lesions. Now not commonly used because of the high side effects. Then now chemotherapy is more commonly used, especially for multifocal lesions, diffuse lesions, and large lesions as a chemoreductive agent, and if the patient's general condition contraindicating excision. The commonly used chemotherapeutic agents are mitomycin C and 5-fluorouracil. Mitomycin C has a selectivity towards tumor cells, and uh, the mitomycin uh, we can use as intraoperatively or as postoperatively. Intraoperatively, 0.02 percentage mitomycin soft sponge is applied to the excision margin for one to, through, one to three minutes. In case of postoperative, we have to prescribe mitomycin only after complete healing of the conjunctival def epithelial defect, and the dose is 0.02 to 0.04 percentage once daily, uh, four times daily for one week, followed by one week of. of and like that we have to give 8 cycles and the mitomycin has to be refrigerated during use and mitomycin has few side effects to reduce side effects we have to add topical steroids and artificial tears along with mitomycin then another chemotherapeutic agent is 5 fluorouracil 1 percent drops the dosage is 1 drop 4 times a day for 1 week followed by 3 week off period the side effects are less compared to mitomycin this patient this is a uh, patient after Two cycles of 5-fluorouracil, uh, size of the lesion is reduced like this. And now immunotherapy is more uh, uh, used for management of OSSN. The commonly used immunotherapeutic agents include interferon alpha 2b. It uh, can be used as a primary agent or, or after excision. The dosage is topical preparation 1 million international unit per 1 million international unit per ml, four times a day for one month after complete resolution of the uh, lesion or a subconjunctal injection of 3 million international units. And it is, uh, toxic is less, but, but disadvantage has to be given for long time. And pegylatory interferon alpha 2b also available, uh, given as subconjunctal injection, three injections cause complete cure, but it has low side effect, but cost is very high. The newer modalities include photodynamic therapy, uh, cause vascular occlusion to the OSS and complete, recurrence of the uh, complete uh, resolution of the lesion, but the cost of photo uh, uh, state is, agent is very high and limited evidence is available in the literature. And subconjunctal anti-VEGF, uh, the bevacizumab of course, reduction in the size of conjunctival OSSN, but no effect on the corneal OSSN. And then, rarely spontaneous regression of uh, OSSN can occur after incisional biopsy since it caused trauma to the base, base of the lesion. And other agents now tried are retinoids and antivirals like cedopovir. The take home message is OSS is an uncommon ocular surface disorder that has to be diagnosed and treated appropriately to prevent ocular and systemic morbidity and mortality. Newer non invasive evaluations correlate well with histopathological tissue diagnosis. And refinement of modern therapeutic options allow cell specific treatment with preservation of limbal stem cells and ocular surface. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Babida, for that wonderful and lucid talk on management of OSSN. Now we would like to invite Dr. Fairoos for the keynote address on recent advances in the management of intraocular tumors. She doesn't need a special mention. She is the director and founder of Horror Speciality Eye Care Bangalore. She did her fellowship from LBPI and she's the vice president of Asia Pacific Ocular Oncology and section editor of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. She has a list of awards and honors to her credit. Best paper awards in A. AAO and AIOS are very few to mention. She is affiliated to Prabhai Hospital, Bangalore, Amardeep Eye Care Kollam, and Malabar Cancer Center, Talasheri. She is the only Carolite to be featured in the Powerless 2021, which features 100 influential women of ophthalmologists across the globe. Thank you for being along with us, madam, and over to you. Hi, Sandhya, and good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity and including me in this session and this is one of my favorite topic and thank you for giving me my favorite topic 
So I'll take you through intraocular tumors, recent advances in management. We have 12 minutes. So going to stick on to a few very important and common uh, intraocular tumors. Um, so I'll take you through a story, okay? So this is an eight-year-old boy who presented to me. In fact, he was treated by a different uh, oncologist and uh, he had anterior segment retinoblastoma. I, as you can see here, he had hypopion in both the eyes both the eyes and in fact left eye was bad so when and this was a picture shared to me by the parent I didn't see him at this point of time I saw him at this point of time when he was treated by another ocular oncologist his left eye as you can see here is almost icicle you know he has a cataract and I definitely have to enucleate it so he was told that that the child would undergo bilateral enucleation because it was very difficult to control the anterior segment retinoblastoma. Anterior segment includes the anterior chamber and there will be a lot of ciliary body involvement where you know seeds starts coming inside into the anterior chamber and only the peripheral retina was involved in this child. So I'm in a dilemma whether I tell them well yes I will have to enucleate both the eyes or give it a try. All right. So there was a desperate attempt to save one eye and that was the right eye all right so this is what I mean by ciliary body so this is how carefully we examine the retinoblastoma children you may find these small white seeds which is sitting in the ciliary body so it's not only the oral examination we go up to the ciliary body press it indent and see whether everything is fine whenever you see an anterior segment hypopion or anterior segment seeding so well it was difficult so he, what he received and what was a strategy that I followed thanks to the advancement in the field of retinoblastoma. Lots of stuffs are happening, good stuffs are happening. So this is what I did. I gave intracameral injection. Intracameral chemotherapeutic agent, topotican, was injected, clear corneal, into the AC, taking care of the AC seeds and of course the ciliary body seeds to some extent, but well, I had to include intravitreal chemotherapy also along with it so it was a localized injection of topotican happening inside the eye for this child well so there are safety enhanced technique that you have to follow you saw these orange spots there these are cryotherapy triple freeze cryotherapy we put three dots even before taking off the needle so that there is no tumor seeding coming outside the intravitreal space into the conjunctival space and causing orbital extension all right so this is exactly how we do it we go to the pass planner approach inject with a 30 gauge needle I used to do 32 gauge needle I don't get it anymore so 30 gauge is what I settled recently and this is what we do how do we do the cryotherapy here even before taking off the needle and well so this was what we did all right so he was fine but then his inferior seedings were not going and in fact it was growing in that eye. Well, I still didn't want to enucleate because there was no systemic risk for him for metastasis into the body, all right? We did a plug brachytherapy in the inferior portion from the five o'clock position to the seven o'clock position to take care of those progressing and non, I mean, resistant seeds. Well, this is how he did. He actually did well with a vision of six by 36 after the plaque and my journey and the child's journey didn't end there he developed a cataract right so there was intravitreal intracameral topotican going in and plaque brachytherapy radiotherapy causes cataract so I have these wonderful people that I work with so Dr. Praveen Murthy is an excellent cataract surgeon in Prabha Eye Hospital in Bangalore so you can see all these synecae and that is because of uh, is my timer? No, okay. I heard some <laughs> sound. All right. And then, uh, you know, the sinecure was, uh, he used a pupil expander and then a very, very careful cataract surgery was done. And we have to be very careful in these children. It's always a clear corneal approach so that if you don't enter the sclera for the fear of extraocular extension and uh, beautiful cataract surgery, an intraocular lens was also placed. All right. And well, so finally we could actually salvage his eye with a vision of 6 by 36, okay, which is good. He's not blind anymore. 
So vitreous seeds in retinoblastoma is something which we were not able to deal for a long, long years. And how have we started dealing with it? Well, there has been a tremendous, you know, evolution in this. We st started using high-dose chemotherapy. We went ahead doing periocular chemotherapy using topotic and melphalan. But, well, it didn't work much. So then came the introduction of the safety-enhanced technique of intravitreal chemotherapy by Kaneko in Japan, who put forward it, and Dr. Munier actually modified it into a safety technique. I was fortunate to work on this project with my mentor, Dr. Carol Shields at Wills. So melphalan and topotican were the two drugs that were used. Initial paper was on melphalan that I published, but then I realized subsequently in the Asian eyes, melphalan was very toxic. I was getting inflammation, there was uveitis, and in fact, I was losing eyes where I was trying to salvage the eyes. So an effective alternative agent to reduce ocular toxicity was topotican. So we did an in vitro study. So when I came into India, I was like not so sure whether, you know, can we do an in vitro study? And we did an in vitro study to know the cytotoxic effect and the effect of topotican when compared to melphalan. And the effect and outcome was very good as compared to melphalan. So this is a 13-year-old male child already enucleated. At 13 years, after 10 years, he gets a recurrence. Okay, in the only eye, that is the left eye. The right eye is a prosthetic eye. And this is how he gets it, diffuse vitreous seeds. And this was a small tumor that was spitting the seeds. Rest, he has a scar in the macula because he has received a radiation when he was three years of age in order to save the eye. And he has allergy to systemic chemotherapy. I can't do systemic chemotherapy again. So what I did was uh, intravitreal chemotherapy. He received four injections, topotican, and this is how it cleared. And with visual aids, well, he is doing fine. In fact, he has grown much taller than me now. Uh, so he's doing his 12th standard now, and he's doing well with that eye. So there has been a lot of eye salvage, vision salvage, when compared to previous. And that is how the advancement of retinoblastoma has happened. So from vitreous seeds in my practice, I have extended the use of intravitreal chemotherapy to subretinal seeds and even endophytic tumor. I'm going to show you that. So this is a child, again, bilateral retinoblastoma, other eye, almost nil vision, but eye salvaged. And this is his right eye. This is also a complicated eye. In fact, he has this tumor on the optic disc. But it's a well-differentiated tumor. We are, uh, you know, following it up with MRI, etc. And lots of subretinal seeds. The child has to have a vision in the eye. So what we did was, again, intravitreal chemotherapy and the subretinal seeds uh, uh, disappeared. And he's been doing wonderfully well for the past four years. Intravitreal topotican in this endovitic tumor. This is one one eye already enucleated, the only one eye of the child, but with excellent vision, topotican, and this is how the tumor regressed. And this is an endophytic tumor, which is jutting into the vitreous. So I did evaluate my uh, uh, 31 eyes, where we actually got an eye salvage of 90%, and recurrence was in one eye out of the 30 eyes. Whenever the tumor recurs, there can be new vitreous seeds as well. So that is about intravitreal chemotherapy. I'm sure you have all heard about intraarterial chemotherapy, but I had to include it because it's also a newer advancement, and especially for the PGs. So what do we do is like we inject uh, chemotherapeutic agents via the ophthalmic artery, to reach the tumor directly. So it's kind of a targeted therapy again into the tumor. And this was a series that we published along with my mentor again, Carol. And we actually found a remarkably effective. And you know where we found the effect? In the D group of tumors. Well, A, B, and C, systemic chemotherapy, well, it is really good. But then systemic chemotherapy, attainment of chemotherapeutic concentration in the vitreous and the tumor per se is very, very less. So group D tumors really help. Can you see the jump? of 47% eye salvage in systemic chemotherapy to 94% with intraarterial chemotherapy. And this is my China series where it's 85%. So, well, this is the advantage of increased drug concentration in the tumor with intraarterial chemotherapy. I don't do the procedure. It's my interventional neuroradiologist who does it. They approach it through the femoral artery. This is how they do it. And what I do is I see the eyes. I decide the drugs and I decide the dosage. And there is a very slow infusion that we make sure that the interventional neuroradiologist is not in a hurry to inject it quick to, you know, um, finish the procedure. It has to be slowly infused. And this is exactly how they do it. They introduce a catheter and then the catheter is confirmed to be sitting in the ostium of the ophthalmic artery 
once it is confirmed fluoroscopically, the chemotherapeutic agents are injected. All right, I'm going to. So I'll just show you the outcomes. Okay, so this is a group D tumors. These are all diffuse subretinal seeds, and this is how it regressed. Four sessions of intraarterial chemotherapy. Even the seeds are regressed. Peripheral tumor. Okay. Well, you don't want to give a systemic chemotherapy, and this was three sessions of intraarterial chemotherapy regressed, and this is the handled HOCT picture where the vision salvage is also quite good in that eye, even the maculan. In fact, intraarterial chemotherapy has a long learning curve. There are certain techniques and caution that you have to maintain in order that you don't land up in vision-threatening complication, which is associated with it. You can have CRAO, you can have vitreous hemorrhage, you can have choroidal atrophy, you can have RP atrophy, but all these things have to be kept in mind if you're trying to save the eye. Group E eyes, we don't use it much, but some parents really badly want to save the eye. We do use it, and this is how it regressed. So this is a vitreous seed which is remaining on top of the tumor. Intravitreal chemotherapy additional, we could salvage the eye. Secondary ISC for recurrence. And this is a child who has received already systemic chemotherapy, and then it recurs, multiple recurrence. Only thing that we did was to give intra-arterial chemotherapy because lasering it, giving plaque brachytherapy at multiple sites, impossible. So that's what we did with IAC. So you might be wondering, well, is it safe? You know, this is the youngest child that I have given IAC, four weeks of age. Intrauterine detection of intraocular tumor, retinoblastoma. Immediately after the child was born, well, we were thinking like, you know, uh, safe to give it, but it was extremely safe, and four weeks was the age, and this is the oldest patient that I gave, that was five years of age. So now, RB is over. I'll just quickly run through the choroidal melanoma, and this is the most common primary intraocular malignancy in adults. You all know it. Well, we all also know that the melanoma therapy, yeah? Done? Okay. One minute? One minute. Okay. So we have enucleation, plug brachytherapy. Plug brachytherapy is uh, what we prefer. You all know about it, and that has been there for a long, long time. But there are certain very new things This I came to know, and this slide is shared by my mentor, Dr. Carol, thanks to her. It's an Aura 011 nanoparticle therapy. So what they do is they inject this particle into the vitreous, and then they give laser light to the tumor. So this is how they're trying to save the eye. Now what they have done, started doing is, in the suprachoroidal space, instead of injecting into the vitreous, they're injecting into the suprachoroidal space and giving the laser light. And melanoma genetics has taken to many, many, many heights. It will take one day or one hour to talk about it, but there are so many drugs which is available because it is metastatic. And this is the metastatic risk depending upon the thickness of the tumor. Almost 47%, 48% if it is 9 millimeters in thickness, and that is what we see in India, very advanced tumors, right? So the cancer genomic atlas, the newer BAF1 mutation which has been identified, the newer drugs that has been identified, lots of stuff is happening in the West because that's the very most common intraocular malignancy seen among the Caucasians. We don't see it much, so most of the research has not reached here. So, well, yeah, this is how the pathway inhibition or the immunotherapy happens. Circumscribed choroidal hemangioma, common benign intraocular tumor, ultrasound B scan, this is what uh, we do, EDIOCT to confirm it, uh, ICG to confirm it, and what we do is, it's not a newer advance, but this is how we manage it, actually. We don't observe it if there is subretinal fluid. So these patients receive PDT, and these are the results of PDT after three sessions. All right. Thank you so very much. Uh, again, once again, thank you for uh, inviting me and thank you for your patient listening. So recent advances has really helped in eye cancer and eye tumors. And we have always been striving to salvage the life. And now we have been able to salvage more eyes and more vision. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam, for that wonderful presentation.